Okay, this video is how to give a presentation. And I'll share with you some thoughts. I've thought about this for many years. Hopefully this will be helpful to you. So starting out, I actually learned this one particular trick from this guy named Johnny Harris. I don't, I don't agree with that guy in a lot of things, but he's great at giving presentations. And one of the things he'll do, he often talks about scenes where a map is involved. So if I'm talking about epidemiology, it's nice to show a map first. Like here's the Pima in uh, Arizona, and here's the Tarahumara population in northern Mexico, Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Cane. So showing the physical map first orientates, orientates the audience to the place that you're talking about. Because the audience has to get it and be able to visualize what you're talking about in order for them to understand and to enjoy it. So when you're talking epidemiology, it helps to show a map first. Then once they're orientated by the map, you can show them the people. And again, it's so much easier to just grasp quickly information from a picture than from you know, just words alone. Um, you can make words more dynamic by vocal changes and, and pacing and whatnot, but words are still words compared to a picture. So try to have good visuals for any uh, t video or talk that you give when that's possible. You know, it depends on the subject and all that, but in general, so this is comparing, you know, the Pima, what happens to them with the standard American diet versus the Tatar Mara who are running ultra marathons. Okay, some things on giving a presentation. Only talk about things that you're really interested in. And, you know, and here's a quote by Goethe, to learn a, t a complex topic, a man must love it. Because if you're interested, then you're going to pursue it with this intense desire to master the subject, and that'll come out when you give a talk, and the talk will be better. Um, that's also why the best talks are usually written by devoted amateurs and not by the so-called prestigious professors who are usually boring and conventional, and they're focused on kind of grant money, okay? That's where it's at in being a professor. The truth really doesn't matter. It matters how do you please the big companies, and that's why almost everything they say or do is really pretty mediocre and often worthless. That's why you can give universities $5 billion to study a subject, and they'll never come up with anything, zero, nada, because the truth doesn't matter. What matters is pleasing the companies that give the funding. All right, so anyways, here's a quote by Arthur Schopenhauer. He lived from 1788 to 1860. Excellence can be attained only where the work has been produced for its sake alone. The truth is that hobbyists treat their subject as an end, whereas the professional treats it as a means. The hobbyist is really in earnest about the matter because he likes it and pursues it con amore. It is these high hobbyists and not the hirelings that have always done the greatest work. Arthur Schopenhauer. Right, so when a man does something out of interest, they produce better work, more original, more interesting, more true to the heart, so to speak, versus when somebody's forced to do something or they're just doing it for money or a formality, it's mediocre. You know, the pyramids were built by slaves and that's partly why they're sort of monotonous and boring versus, you know, and under forced rules, okay? Versus the cathedrals were built by free men who were religious and sort of motivated, and that's why they're creative and they're great. But, you know, it's not enough to be free. You know, free men build modern buildings. Most of them are free, at least. But they look like crap. They look like animal cages. They, you know, here's a quote from Thomas Wolfe. Modern buildings look like animal cages, and there's always a statue of a turd in front. Okay, it's Tom Wolfe, the writer from the 1900s primarily. And so if you don't have good metaphysics, then you're also going to produce crap work, okay? Um, it's important to get all this stuff right because I'll just give you an example. Um, I have a friend. I'll just talk about a friend in college, and he was a very bright guy at Stanford. But he wasn't, he wasn't that motivated. He was kind of would sleep late each day and had a hard time figuring out what he wanted to do versus a motivated people like me and my other friend, we would jump out of bed in the morning and do you know everything we could do. We, we're, we're, if your attitude is right, your sense of purpose, your goals are clear and fixed and in agreement in your conscious mind and your subconscious mind, you get way more energy. So that's why you gotta spend time on figuring out, do I really wanna do this? Is this worth doing? Do I have the resources, the context, the time? Is this worth going for? And once you say yes, then you go for it. Um, you got to get that straight though, because if you just sort of half-ass into it, oh, okay, I'll do this, then it ends up being crappy. And also, like I said, talk about what you want to talk about. You know, like when I was in residency, you know, 
I was doing, let's say I was, I was rotating through surgical, well, I had to actually briefly do a pediatrics rotation, and I was not that enthusiastic about doing pediatrics, and I wanted to do a bunch of spinal taps to get better at spinal taps. I didn't care too much about a lot of ped stuff, and so they wanted me to talk about some boring thing. We had to give a, a lecture at the end of our rotation, and I refused to do the topics assigned to me by the attending. I said, nope. I'm interested in, you know, the brain. I'm going to talk about brain topics. And so they, like, downgraded my grade. I could care less. I, what I'm trying to say is I knew my presentation was good because it's what I wanted to talk about. I put a lot of time into it. I don't care. I'm not going to talk about, you know, uh, parasophageal diaphragmatic hernia. I could care less about that. So you're going to have to be willing also as a creative person to take that you're going to get criticized, even downgraded sometimes. And so you have to decide if it's worth it or not, depending on the situation. Okay. Um... Most presentations, as we all know from you know watching internet videos or doing other things that we have to do in our life, they're boring. They're conventional with old information. You already know it. So whenever you give a talk, you know unless you've got something new to say or something unpredictable and fun and good, then try not to give a talk on that. Otherwise, it's kind of a waste of time. Um, here's a quote by Goethe, the great uh, German writer. He said, "All professional men are handicapped by being." not being allowed to ignore things that are useless, okay? Yeah, don't you hate it when somebody starts rattling off all this boring information that everybody knows? And it's like I said, like talking about drugs and surgery for coronary artery disease. If a cardiologist speaks, he has to talk about stenting drugs and surgery. They're obligated. And they're almost obligated not to talk about nutrition, which is the only thing that really works well for coronary artery disease. So it's impossible for a cardiologist to give a good talk on coronary artery disease. So that's what's kind of funny, you know. Um, you know, you can get a pathologist and uh, they'll give a much better talk about coronary artery disease. That's funny. Okay, anyways, uh, good talk should be infotainment, information and entertainment. Uh, because if the speaker's enjoying the material, they should make it enjoyable for the audience too. Um, and you know, when you're learning something you care about, it's enjoyable. Uh, stories are much better than data. A talk with too much data usually sucks. Um, it's like I never liked internal medicine talks. They show all these slides, data, 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 and you know, almost no images, no aesthetic sense. Um, you know, they really ought to spend more time hanging around with radiologists and artists and, and learn how to make a talk more entertaining. Their talks are so boring, it's painful. Um, a good talk should be part academic lecture, part entertainment, part a work of art. Um, it's good to look at watch comedians like some of the greatest comedians who ever lived are Rodney Dangerfield, Eddie Murphy, and Sam Kinison. They're great speakers. They walk around the stage that creates interest in the audience. You know, our eyes like to follow something that's moving, and they have big changes in their wide vocal range, um, and they're and they're pacing fast, slow, fast, slow. They get that you know pregnant pause of anticipation. They're great, you know. So when I first, be, I've given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos, lectures and talks. So when I first started out though, many, many years ago, I used to listen to a, an audio CD in the car of these comedians before I would have to give a talk because it would just create the right mood and sense of timing uh, and things would go better. Um, people are more interested in things. So try to have people, some photographs of people in your talk or, or drawings or something. Can't just be all dry scientific data. People can get bored with that. Um, the opener should be something fun, uh, preferably a picture or a drawing. It helps set the mood for the talk. Um, you should always be able to talk at least three times longer than what the allotted time is. You should know it so well um, that it just comes out easily. And when you know it that well, um, you'll be able to handle random questions on the topic. Um, you should have familiarity with the material in a conversation. Have a conversation with some friends who are interested in it because that way when you actually give the talk, You'll have that feel for what works in a conversation, and it'll be more conversant to the audience's ear. They'll, they'll appreciate that. Um, sometimes to familiarize yourself with the material is write an essay on it, a blog, a book chapter, or something, um, a research paper. All of that gets the material uh, much more closely familiar to you. Um, give a small practice presentation, perhaps to some friends, before you give it on a bigger to a bigger audience in a bigger venue um, focus on the content that the audience is interested in for example you know talk about what people care about a lot of PhDs they screw up when they give lectures about scientific topics because they're only talking to other PhD experts in their own field and you know that's going to be boring to anyone else so I mean if you have to do that you have to do that but just be aware of the audience and try to make sure the talk is useful to them interesting to them um, 
Also, you know, be in touch with your own feelings. You know, deep feelings that kind of seem odd or awkward or under tension, those often are good to talk about because if you're feeling awkward and tense about something or uncertain, the audience is probably feeling the same thing. And, um, you know, like here's a quote at the bottom from Beethoven. An artist is someone who has learned to trust himself. Yeah, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson had a quote along those lines or two. That which is most deep and personal is actually most universal. And, you know, you just have to feel the confidence to say, this is what I think. And, you know, you might, you might hit and you might miss. But, you know, more likely than not, the audience will sense that tension. And they've probably been thinking the same thing. And they're glad you addressed that key issue. Because, you know, think about a lot of these talks that suck. The author never gets to the point. What am I supposed to do? What should change in my thinking or my behavior? And if you don't address that, then you know what's the point of the talk? So address that. Even if it's kind of awkward and controversial, that's kind of the key point of the whole talk. Um, it's good to get the anecdotes from your personal life or history because a lot of times they're more valuable than research study. For example, I remember when I was a you know a resident, you know, this attendings were like, oh, we must not trust anecdotal information, only go by research. BS. Research quite often is paid off and bogus. Anecdotal information is coming from somebody, usually a friend, who's telling you the truth. Um, talk like you are talking to an intelligent friend. Yeah, if the talk is like a conversation, like a dialogue with a friend, you're going to move from topic to topic, from thread to thread more smoothly, and it's going to be more pleasant. You just have to trust yourself to do that. If something's interesting or funny to you, it'll probably be the same for the audience. Um, and that's sort of like there's different conversational theories like the narrative paradigm and whatnot. And, and basically, conversation with an intelligent friend works to give the best presentations rather than formal monotone. That sucks, and that's what usually a lot of people do. Um, talk about things that are people are scared to. I mean, obviously, you have to use your judgment. Certain things you probably can't really talk about, but push it as far as you can to you know talk about things that are interesting make it a little more complicated than some of the audience members might be comfortable with. so what you'll come back to the basic stuff pretty fast but you'll you'll hit on that key point talk about the controversy to the extent that you can the dogma to the extent that you can male female differences to the extent that you can okay and for example i'm just going to show it's good to show some artwork if you if you can and if you've got time and space because a lot of times artwork is really inspiring especially if it fits the story like for example i see this painting from 1435 by roger van der Veden, and i'm like holy crap it's so incredible so far ahead of its time when you see great works of art like this you say to yourself gosh if this guy could do this in 1435 why can't i do better why can't i do more i love this painting it was it was funded by the archers guild so the hands of jesu christu are like like he's a bow and arrow and they're pulling it back and you know mary echoes him i just think that's one of the most incredible paintings ever okay and i love this painting here of sadak in search of the waters of forgetting by john martin 1812 so you see him climbing up these uh, rocks to the top of the mountain, and that's the same feeling one gets when they're on an intellectual quest. So one can identify it. And you know, I love the quote by Ayn Rand. I'm going to show it in the talk in a moment here. She says, "Art is a concretization of uh, metaphysics, meaning that the artist, in, you know, encapsulates the whole feeling, the whole meaning into this one picture. You can get the idea of striving towards a good goal from this painting." so much faster than any words could describe it. And so when the painting matches what the individuals are trying to accomplish, it resonates and it's very memorable. People are going to remember the mood of the talk, the jokes, the metaphors, the key points, and the pictures more than anything else. Um, and I love this painting, especially if you're talking about problems of health and middle-aged persons. This is what we all go through. This is from The Voyage of Life. This is the middle age part. It's a series of four paintings by Thomas Cole. Um, it's from the he's, he was like the leader of the Hudson River School in the 1840s, and it's just a magnificent painting. You know, he's in middle age. You know, the guy when he's young, he's all confident. In middle age, he's like going over the rapids. The the oars have fallen out of the boat. He's hoping the boat doesn't get crushed. You know, his guardian angel or mama's pretty far away now. So, you know, we all go through some times like that in our lives, and this painting just gets it. 
okay, how to improve a presentation, continued here, try to come up with some good metaphors. If you just think about something a lot and have conversations with friends about it, you'll be just taking a shower in the morning, boom, a great idea will come to you. Write it down as fast as you can before you forget it. You know, a lot of times I'll be waking in bed, you know, the sort of the moment, you know, half hour, hour before you wake up and you're, you roll around and an idea comes into your head, remember it. As soon as you get up, write it down. Because um, it's like your subconscious mind is like search through the whole library of your life to find that piece of information and it's you know coughing it up to you like a like a whale coughing something up on the beach and man you got to take it when it's there and then write it down right away so you don't forget it and a lot of times those are your best ideas the body's got a lot of brain power that's just not in the conscious area um best mood is something positive and fun if you like the topic you should have a positive and fun mood for most topics um, real learning is something personal. For example, school is kind of a joke. Don't think of school as real learning or teaching because think about school. How much do you remember from junior high or grade school where you're being forced to study stuff by a you know, foreign entity, by your teacher and by the school and, and, and for a test and it's all a pain in the ass versus when you really want to learn something like I was on the wrestling team. I wanted to learn a technique because I wanted to win the match. That's real learning and that's memorable. Um, so. That's the way, you know, obviously I think of learning nutrition and pathophysiology. It's to improve your health so you feel better, live longer, and you help other people. That's, that sticks with you. Um, start with blank slides when you make a slide. That way you shape it on your own uh, most of the time. It's okay to have a, a template for where to put the text, but most of the time it should come from your ideas rather than I, the, those cheesy, corny templates and PowerPoint and stuff. You know, they're distracting. I don't think they're helping. I don't like the special effects. It's sort of like there's enough modern flashing lights. I don't want any extra ones in the modern world. Um, you should try to have a story for your slides. Try to make it entertaining, useful, interesting, concise. Um, you should have more pictures and diagram slides than word slides. Try not to have too many of these word slides. I like to have some, and I think you know there's going to be more motivated persons in the audience who go back over the video later, and they're going to want all this information. Um, but you know, most persons are just going to grasp a couple key points, and that's the most important thing in the lecture. But I like having them for that purpose, and also they're you know like a cue card. You can look at them yourself and read them. That makes it easier. You should dress nice. It's a sign of respect for the audience and the topic. Was the reason I don't have a tie on is because my family, I got family members who tie up the laundry and they just leave their stuff there and they go away for hours and it's a big mess. And so I can't get to the laundry as often as I want to. And I, you know, I don't have any of my dress shirts. These are the ones with the buttons on them. Oxford is they're paying for wearing a tie. I like the buttonless collars for my ties. So that's why I don't got a tie on. Um, otherwise, of course I would. Rhetoric or impact boosters. If you're serious about learning to be a good presenter, you should study rhetoric a bit. If you want to be a good writer, you have to know something about rhetoric and the ancient Greeks and, you know, the concepts of rhetorical questions and, you know, chiasmus and all that stuff. They're impact boosters. They focus attention. You know, the Greeks were smart. They studied all the best speakers in society who were men that they admired, and they wrote down their techniques of making good speeches. And that's what rhetoric is, and Aristotle summarized all that. Aristotle summarized all the knowledge of the ancient world. You know, he was the encyclopedia and a biologist and a philosopher. Vary the font size on the slides, um, you know, at least color or highlighting or something to, you know, create a little bit of contrast and variety. You know, I like to put bold on here. I'll change the color of the font. When I write a book, I'll, I'll change the text size too, and even the text. Uh, font, you know, sometimes outline font, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, helpful to tell the audience uh, something like these are the key three take-home points, or this is the most important slide of the talk. So they can help them to get the key point out of the talk because sometimes you know they don't want to lose them in the uh, forest. Okay, uh, and there's too much information sometimes. Um, after you talked about problems with the food or disease, make sure you, you give some solutions. Don't just talk about negative stuff. Make sure there's an answer to what to do. Um, end on a high note. Try to have something good or noble or worth remembering. Um, I'm going to give you some book recommendations if you're serious about pre presenting. So, you know, I was really uh, serious about trying to get good at writing. 
And I actually think I'm a much better writer than a presenter, but I'll show you some stuff. So here's a book called The Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand's like the smartest lady who ever lived. She's a real genius, and I think she's actually what I would call a closet Catholic. Even though she'll make fun of religion, all she does is say how great the Christian writers are, how great Dostoevsky is, how great Victor Hugo is, okay, and, and the other ones. So this book is absolutely brilliant, The Romantic Manifesto. I not only uh, have read it a couple times, I've... Uh, I got to listen to the audio CD version in the car. I love it. Okay, uh, Public Speaking by Brian Tracy. He's got a bunch of videos online. He's real good. He's got a real upbeat, positive, can-do type of attitude. I like him. Um, I love this book. This was helpful to me in shaping my, my writing skills and my thinking skills, the art of literature. So Schopenhauer, you know, he's a bit of a crazy genius. And like Ayn Rand's a crazy genius. All the geniuses are tend to be crazy. So you got to accept that. Otherwise, you don't ever get to learn their work. And he talked. He spent a long time trying to figure out what makes a good book? He, he could read like in five different languages. What creates something truly worth remembering, of high quality, of value, um, which deserves to be preserved for, you know, long term for a thousand years? And, and he's, he's quite good on that subject. I was very impressed by uh, Schopenhauer on those types of subjects. He was sort of a lonely, wealthy old guy who s s sat around thinking and learning and reading. He was so smart and so far ahead of his time in Germany that he was the best philosopher in the whole country. You know, probably the best philosopher that ever lived coming out of Germany. Um, Nietzsche in his own way, too, but Nietzsche's pain in the ass. But Nietzsche's great, obviously, in his own way. Um, but anyways, the reason I mentioned Schopenhauer was he couldn't get a job as a philosopher. And that's what's funny. It's like if you are great, quite often that means you're unacceptable to conventional wisdom. Okay. For example, if you want to treat diabetes, none of the doctors who treat diabetes that I've ever met knows that much about uh, nutrition and diabetes, which is the cause of diabetes. Don't get me wrong, I know there's some great famous ones out there who do, but I'm just saying they're the exception, not the rule. And it's the same thing. We just talked about coronary artery disease. There's no cardiologist I've ever met that really knows nutrition and atherosclerosis and Esselstyn's work. Okay, come on. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot on the internet now. That's starting to happen. Not a lot, there's some on the internet now. Uh, but still, you get the point. Okay, um, and then here I'll show you this book. This is a book I wrote called Rhyme, Rhetoric, and Logic. This is the fourth edition. I wrote this in 2020. And I basically, you know, when I had written some books in the past, my friends had teased them about it. I had given the books to my friends to read, and they got back with their comments. And some of these guys write a lot. And they just sort of mocked my writing technique and style. And everything they said was true. And that greatly motivated me. I read like everything one could read about writing. Every book that I could get my hands on, every blog post. Uh, I read a ton, a ton on that, including every little thing. Because um, I was fascinated by it. Okay, so anyways, I, I summarize it all in that book plus a bunch of my own ideas. And I'll come back to what happened that year at the end of this talk. Okay, so here's just another example of, you know, showing the map, then showing the person and talking about the epidemiology. Yanomamo, uh, no salt added, no hypertension. Okay, now here's a slide that's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of fun. You know, and this is, a lot of times people draw this inverted. They'll show deep dives. And what I'm showing here is working up from, con from useful, con useful concepts that everybody knows, common knowledge, to more complex, interesting things, and then connecting different fields, and then there's an AO at the top. And it's a, it's funny also because it's almost like a Johnson, and then an AO at the top coming out of it. So it's to me, it's a little bit funny, kind of tacky, but it's a reminder, too, to the audience in that context that even though we'll get up into some complex stuff, we're going to come right back to common knowledge stuff and stuff that's applicable to regular life. So that can be helpful to sort of reassure the audience that you're not going to bore them with a bunch of jargon. Um, a table of data can quickly show a lot of information. So this basically shows standard American diet, the rice-based diet of Asia, um, but also with tons of sodium and tobacco causes problems for health. Um, it's not the rice, it's the tobacco and the so sodium. Um, the, eight East, the South Asian diet from, like, from India, their problem, main problem is too much fried food. But, and then the low-fat, low-sodium vegan, how it's so much better than all these diets. So in this one table, it can summarize a ton of information that would take easily more than 20 pages to write it all out. And then, you know, another, also a picture can really catch a metaphor. Like Dennis Burkett said, the main things people would remember if you see somebody years later after they'd watch this talk is they would remember the picture, you know. Population with small stools, need small hospitals, 
but no, with big stools, need small hospitals. You know what I'm talking about, all the Dennis Burkett pictures. Um, so this just summarizes, look, you win in every way. What more do you want? You know, good luck getting that good of a deal for just about anything else in life. Okay, and then for this one here, this is before I gave the story of the zookeeper and the doctor. And so I'm um, orientating the audience to monkeys. And it's fun because it's a fairy tale. And, of course, the monkeys are like the humans. So I had fun with this one. You guys probably heard me tell this one before. Um, and then what I had added to it, though, of course, was the person I thought of is I got this idea after reading the biography of Walter Kempner, okay, because his life was just like the zookeeper. And uh, it was kind of fun. And, uh, you know, I had this picture about, you know, his life. And his life was kind of like that. He was a really good-looking guy, and he wasn't married. He had girlfriends and houses with connected sidewalks to his house and then he had the one girl so but anyways the guy was like the rock star perhaps the greatest doctor who ever lived uh, so it's a rather in, extraordinary story okay for giving a talk to when you make your own diagrams a couple things that will add emphasis you know color coding the work normal is green uh, disease is red and uh, you know black's also good for neutral things um, when something's important like ATP is important to be made by a normal cell it's a worker you put that in big letters uh, when something else is especially important for the cancer cell, I'll put this in big letters over here. Red will draw attention. Bright colors draw attention. Use a different color for the glutamine. So just by varying the colors, you can, can, you can put a lot more information into a small space. So you want to play around with all these things. A black and white drawing in comparison would be pretty boring and limited. Um, there's something called reading gravity, meaning that we normally go from this side of the page to this side of the page. And then we also go to the line down, the line down, the line down. So um, a drawing that shows a story in time should always begin in this corner and work its way down to this corner. If you were to start in this corner and go up to this corner, that would be awkward. The worst of all would be to start up in this corner and then go down to there. That would just like annoy the crap out of the audience. It would make their head hurt to look at that. So it has to go in the direction of reading gravity. Yeah, like I read these, I read a couple books on graphics and fonts and textile and you know, how a book is made. I was interested in all that stuff. It's good to have pictures of people from real life. Like these are my wrestling coaches at Stanford. They were World and Olympic champions. That's Mark Shelf winning in the NCAA finals over Bannock, who was the Iowa national champ. Uh, this is Dave Schultz. He also won a national championship year, his brother. Uh, that's Andre Metzger actually there from the back. So anyways, if you can tie things in with real people, that's more entertaining. Humans care about humans more than they care about other things. Uh, most of the time. So um, try to you know connect things to the human side of things when you give a talk. Okay, now if you want to make a, like a scientific diagram here, this is cancer, initiation, tumor promotion, uh, tumor invasion, and metastases. You know, using color coding enables you to put a lot of information on the slide. If this was all, you know, drawn with black ink, so to speak, it would be hard to follow. But I think it's reasonably straightforward initiation, tumor promotion, invasion mats, and then with different colors for the stuff above and below it. And one can convey a lot of information. And then, you know, the audience, the ones that are motivated and especially interested, they can go back to this and it's useful to them. You're trying to hit the sweet spot between concise but still useful and clear. And then, you know, you can take things, the way we learn anything is we connect the new information to what we already know. So everybody's seen plenty of these uh, normal distributions, so you can connect that with where's things at with the population and you know how you want to be in the top group for health and nutrition. And then also, you know, learning can be fun. You know, I had fun making this. I think it's enjoyable to look at. You know, you talk about, and it's also educational, how one progresses up from the worst diet to the best diet. And by the way, you're always, there's no real controversy about this. You're going to hear people try to say all these crappy diets at the bottom are good. And that's just because, you know, there's these food companies make billions of dollars selling all this crap, all right? So that has to continue. If a food company makes billions of dollars per year, they're going to have millions and millions of dollars to spend on their advertising budget and to pay people to go around on the Internet like trolls and keep saying how great these high-fat, <laughs> meat terrible diets are so you know you got to learn to use your own knowledge to make these judgments so you don't end up fat and sick like most people 
Okay, I'm going to talk. These are sort of advanced philosophic concepts and some interesting things. Okay, this is a painting of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, the painter was Santo di Tito in 1593, and I love this painting. He sort of goes before Hazel Christo and he says, I tried my best. I'm sorry I didn't do better, but, you know, and then Hazel Christo says, oh, you did pretty well. It's okay. And um, what I'm trying to say is, Having a sense of a mission and a purpose, it energizes you. You want that, okay? Uh, my story was in college. I, you know, I'd been a great athlete before I got injured. Then I sort of went downhill in my athletic career. Stanford still offered me a scholarship. And I had recurrent injury at my first year. I was all frustrated and sad. And my mother said, God doesn't want you to be a wrestler. He wants you to be a doctor or a scientist. You're going to be a great doctor or scientist. And I was pretty sad about getting injured again in wrestling. But... It inspired me what my mother said, and I loved my mom, and I was closer to my mom than anyone else in the whole world. And so that sort of motivated me. That's the Alfred Adler inferiority, inferiority complex principle, whereby when you're sad and frustrated about failing in one area, you overcompensate in another area. And that can energize you to take that frustration energy instead of just wasting it in frustration, put it into achieving something in another area. And having that sense of purpose will greatly energize you. Because, you know, I, I know a lot of young people. I know a lot of middle-aged and older people. And, and what I see in most of the people I know is just a lack of energy. They don't have enough energy to read a book. They don't have enough energy to change their diet. They don't have enough energy to work out or something. Whereas I think, you know, I've had great energy. And I think it's because I know exactly who I am. I know exactly what I want to accomplish. And I know why I'm doing it. And I know who my heroes are that I admire, who I want to be like. And so I push myself um, and that gives me energy. It enables me to do a lot of things, and I'm glad for that. Rule number one, first thing in the morning, you do your intellectual work. You don't have a cup of coffee. You don't bullshit around. You don't wake up late. You get out of bed, and you get to intellectual work because your brain's fresh. When is an animal smartest? When he's hungry after you fasted overnight, and you get this burst of energy in the morning, and you, everything is clear. Your brain, the glymphatic system has cleaned your brain. The waste products from your neurons have all been washed away. That's when you can do your best intellectual work. You know, you don't want to eat right away. As soon as you eat, especially if you eat a big lunch, for example, or a late breakfast, your IQ drops about 30 points. So if you want to do something of high quality intellectual work, do it as soon as you wake up out in the morning. You just get up, go right to your desk, and start working. Um, when you have to give a presentation, if it's a short one, no big deal. But if you have to give a presentation that's going to be an hour or longer, um, here's a trick I found helpful. One and a half hours before the talk, I'll drink 32 ounces of beet juice and then chase that with 16 ounces of water to clean my teeth off, to hydrate. And I know from experience that just gives me more energy and I'm more articulate. The words come faster when I do that. Um, have respect for religion. The modern world tends to have contempt for religion, but that's also why the modern world sucks at most things, okay? If you think about it, look, you know, we try to treat dietary diseases with drugs and it doesn't work. Our art, modern art's a joke, it stinks, okay? Modern architecture, we're just talking about it, it stinks. Modern buildings look like animal cages with a statue of a turd in front. How does that inspire a human being? How much good painting do we see? How much good literature do we see? Not much, and what I'm trying to say is respect religion, study these old time people, You'll be amazed at the things that they did. Um, and also have good role models, okay? Um, now, the downside is if you truly have a sense of purpose, you know, like I said, my, most modern artists and writers have forgotten God, and that's why they suck, okay? Without religion, um, you just do something for money or you go through the motions, it's going to be hollow, mediocre crap. Yeah, you want to get paid. we got to feed ourselves, feed our families, but... I'm talking about for somebody who really wants to do high quality work. I'm not just talking about BS for your, you know, your high school presentation that you don't care about. I'm talking about how can you produce high quality work in a field in an area that you care about and having a sense of purpose, a sense of mission, a sense of I want to make something good for my audience or I want to create something, you know, of high quality that's memorable and worthwhile. You have to get your metaphysics correct. And like I said, I know a guy who's a great artist. But he's not that motivated, and he'll sometimes, you know, sleep late in the morning pretty routinely. And I'm like, you can't be great at achieving intellectual things unless you're highly motivated, because it takes tons of energy. If you look at all these great achievers in the arts and the sciences, and most of these, most of them are energetic sort of monomaniacs, and I think that enables you to do more work. Um, a lot of, for many years, I've thought of myself as being a little bit like a modern version of Thomas Aquinas, somebody who could unify multiple fields like he did with Greek knowledge and especially Aristotle and Christianity. And 
that takes a lot of energy. But when you recognize in yourself something that a role model, you know, did a lot more than you, but at least you can aspire in that direction, it'll energize you. And I'll just give you another example. In around 2020 or so, when this recent plague had started, nobody knew what was going to happen. They didn't know if everybody's going to die. They didn't know what was going to happen in society. And in my mind, I had six books that I wanted to write. And I thought of Isaac Newton in 1665. What he, he's the greatest scientist who ever lived. He was a super religious guy. And he went to his family cottage in 1665 after he just graduated from Oxford. And he isolated himself. And all he did was work on his scientific and religious ideas. And during that one year, 1665, he made great discoveries in optics and physics and calculus and gravity and astronomy. And that's called the Anno Mirabilis, the miracle year of 1665. So, you know, I'm no Isaac Newton, but... I still, I wanted to achieve my goals, so I knew that I didn't know what was going to happen. So I isolated myself for one year. I said to myself, no social media, almost zero social inter interaction. Um, and I heard this quote too. Um, it's called, resources are the enemy of creativity. And what that means is, you can always make some excuse. Oh, I can't write this book until I read a couple more things or talk to a couple more persons. No, start writing the book. If you can, you'll try to talk to them and read those things along the way. But start the book. Start the book. Um, and uh, forget about it. And sometimes having less resources, you just sit at your desk and, and work on the book. Um, all my free time was focused on the book. Night and day, that's all I thought about. Other than the, you know, I had to go through the motions, do my job, you know, I had to fulfill my obligations to my family. But other than that, all I thought about was those books. Um, I sort of thought that was going to be my legacy, potentially. I didn't know. And I also read about Robert Piercig, who wrote the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, you know, an awesome, fantastic book, you know, one of the best books ever written on philosophy. Uh, perhaps the best. And he would go to bed early so he could wake up at 4 a.m., even some mornings earlier than that, and then he could write before he went to his job. And it was really um, inspiring. So, I mean, that worked for me. I was so energized with this. I would wake up early every morning and I would just write, write, write to the last minute that I'd have to. I was working full time and I finished and published all six books in one year. So, those are the things that energize me and that's where it all comes from. So, don't pay attention to these secular universities. They suck, okay? They don't produce anything worth a crap. If you want to do great work, study the men of the past, the women of the past, and see how they did it. And that will give you ideas and energize you and help you.